Hello and welcome to Access Asia. I'm Delano D'Souza. Coming up on the show this week. The campaign rhetoric remains feisty as India's election reaches its final stretch. Results of the vote due out in under two weeks' time. As more countries around the world seek to close their borders to asylum seekers, we'll be speaking to the founder of an online language platform designed for refugees. And the dark side of K-beauty under the spotlight, we tell you about the obsession with thinness over in South Korea. Now, there are less than two weeks to go until the results are in for India's election. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is seeking a third term in office. The vote was initially cast as a referendum on him, with the opposition warning it would hasten India's democratic decline. But after voting started, Modi came under fire for making Islamophobic uh, statements. However, in recent interviews with local media, he seems to have backtracked, saying he's never indulged in Hindu-Muslim politics. Now, this election will see 18 million first-time voters going to the polls, and the ruling BJP is banking on the use of influencers to rake in the youth vote. France 24's team on the ground filed this report. In New Delhi, a meeting of more than 1,000 people has been organized by Prime Minister Modi's party. These individuals gathered here are not the BJP workers, but social media influencers. We can influence 100, 1,000, 1 lakh, 10 lakh, 1 crore with a single cell phone. In an attempt to influence the influencers, members of the party provide strict guidelines instructing them on creating content that could bring Narendra Modi his third successive victory. We have to say why Modi is great. With five points, you make a video about it, put it in your social media channels. The BGP is reaching out to influencers from all walks of life. This beauty influencer with around 25,000 Instagram followers is now creating content loaded with political undertone. Anna Malai Ji has provided the guidelines for us. This is a very big hand for us. And we should use this thing and influence it. We should influence it. This 30-year-old woman is voluntarily promoting the party, but many, like this young boy, are approached by politicians to convey their messages. Like the poster, I see what I like, I will share it on WhatsApp, and I will send it to my group in my village. I have said that we will meet. We will meet with 4,000 to 5,000. Small influencers receive few euros for hours of work, but creators with millions of followers are paid up to 5,000 euros. BJP's media spokesperson says these content creators help in shaping the opinions of people without firm ideology. When you take positive things of the party, it definitely matters. Our young influencers, they help attract young voters. One crore or plus votes extra. In India, more than half of the population is under 30 and 80% own a smartphone. Realizing their significance, political parties are betting on influencers in this election. Now on the show this week, we're going to uh, speak with tech entrepreneur Mursal Hedayat. Her parents fled Afghanistan for the UK when she was just four years old. She launched an online language platform, Chatterbox, to help refugees from around the world. Mursal is a member of the Order of the British Empire and was named as part of Forbes's 30 Under 30 for Social Entrepreneurs Europe back in 2018. Great to have you on the program with us, Mursal. Firstly, tell us, what, what exactly is Chatterbox? Okay, so what it's not is teaching refugees languages. As a company, we value the skills and talents of forcibly, so forcibly displaced people. A lot of the time when people think of refugees, they think of uneducated, dangerous hordes of people, you know, forcing themselves into Europe. What I see as a refugee from Afghanistan is a, a group of extremely hardworking people who are motivated to rebuild their lives. And so Chatterbox is employed almost exclusively with refugee talent. And these refugees are the ones teaching professionals at top companies. What experiences from your childhood made you want to launch this, this platform? You know, a memory I'll never lose is one watching my mum in the job centre in the UK. So my mum is a civil engineer. Uh, she graduated as one of only four women in her year at Kabul University. Um, but in one of the world's biggest economies, most advanced economies, the UK, she could only find work as a cleaner. Hmm. Um, and I remember going to the job centre where you go to get social security in the UK and hearing how talked down to she was by the advisor there. 
And this ferocious woman who has basically pushed all four of her children through university into professions, seeing her so meek and, and, and vulnerable, really, in the existing system, mm. that's a memory that motivates me even today. I think how we treat refugees deserves a lot of uh, attention and improvement. Did your mother ever find her footing? She did. She became a language teacher. So that's why, that's why the language interested you. Yeah, it is. I mean, I, I am a, someone who believes in, uh, in technology. I believe in capitalism. And I think that a lot of scalable solutions to social problems can be found using these uh, tools. And in the case of my mom, I mean, so many migrants and refugees whose qualifications and overseas experience isn't respected in places like Europe, they find their language as the, the catalyst to la labor market reintegration as translators, yeah. interpreters, and language teachers. And Chatterbox has just built software that scales this as an opportunity in this $360 billion language learning industry. And what are your links with Afghanistan today? Well, I, I last visited Afghanistan in 2006. Um, so very a while ago, yeah. Yeah, very different time. I mean, I was so impressed by how vigorously Kabul was being built and the hope and aspirations of my cousins and the people I met. Obviously, it's a very different situation now. And my last contact with family and, and the community there was assisting with bringing exclusively women to Albania after the Taliban took over again. Do you have hope for the future of the country? Because it seems that since the Taliban has taken over, Afghanistan has regressed so much. Uh, the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice, right? I think that overall things are improving, and Afghanistan may be one of the laggards in development, but I definitely see, hopefully in my lifetime, uh, that things will improve. We have countries around the world in Mursal who want to uh, sort of close off their borders to refugees. We see the discourse over in the United States, here in Europe, here in France, uh, in the UK, of course. Uh, as a child of refugees, how does this make you feel? You know, a profound statistic that I came across recently is that there's one refugee to every 230 people on the planet today. If you got any group of 230 people from any place or any time and you said, there's someone here who can't go back home because they're in danger of death or persecution and all they need is food, water and shelter and the chance to rebuild their lives, there are not 230 people anywhere who would refuse them. The fact that there is such contention is a purely a project of politics. Mm. Politics by desperate politicians with no ambition for the future and who are scapegoating one of the most vulnerable communities in the world. And since you're from the UK, based in the UK, I have to ask you about uh, a lot of policies that come uh, out of the UK. Over the past few years, we've had uh, home secretaries who've been women of colour, like yourself, who are pushing very harsh uh, policies against migrants. We even had the former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, said she she waited to, wanted to see flights taking off to Rwanda. That was her hope, her dream. Um, how does this all make you feel? I mean, it's all rather ghoulish, isn't it? Um, hearing these things come from people whose own parents kind of traveled the world in search of opportunity and a better life for their children. But what I would say to that is, this is not a consensus, nowhere near a consensus. And the vast majority of Britons and Europeans stand against this kind of uh, corrosive identity politics that pits one group against the other. You know, uh, going back to that story where you said your mother was in the job center and she felt meek or you, you felt that she, she was meek. Do you think that things are changing now that you have online platforms like Chatterbox and, and or is the discourse always going to uh, marginalize the refugee? You know, when I started Chatterbox, uh, it was a very different landscape. 2015 to, to 2016 was the height of the European refugee migrant crisis. Um, and I think things have changed a lot thanks to companies like ours. So we exclusively teach languages using refugees as language teachers to top corporates. Mm. Um, so BNP Paribas, the International Federation of the Red Cross, are all clients of Chatterboxes. Mm. And these companies own HR teams, use Chatterbox to train their employees. So they can't help but start to think that refugees are people with value whom they could eventually employ. And I've definitely seen that sh transition through organizations like the Tent Foundation, massive global corporations making a solid and real commitment to employ refugees and assist with their reintegration. So in seven years, things have changed a lot. And I'm, I'm very, very proud of the work that we've done.
It's amazing. Uh, good luck, uh, and uh, thank you for speaking to us here on France 24. Thank you so much. Now, South Korea is known for K-pop. It's gripping uh, television dramas and beauty products. But inside the country, the obsession with looking good has a harmful side. Take a look. Does Korea have an obsession with being thin? In Seoul, slender frames are becoming increasingly common, influenced by the appearance of celebrities and K-pop stars. But losing weight has led to some extreme methods. With a hidden camera, we visited this clinic. It handed out slimming pills without any proper consultation. Some people queue all night to get their hands on them. One of my friends lost eight kilos in very little time thanks to these pills. When you go in, the doctor asks you how much you want to lose, and a minute later they prescribe you the pills. The side effects are strong though and include insomnia, tachycardia and concentration problems. In an ultra-competitive society, many Koreans focus heavily on their appearance. Juri Kim, a popular actress in Korea, says she ruined her health to succeed in castings. My weight dropped to 46 kilos. When I was very young, I was really insecure about my cheeks, especially in the morning. I thought my face looked swollen and I looked bigger on screen. When I turned 17, I forced myself to pull all-nighters. I did that for about two years. This former plus-size model is pushing for more diversity and has created her own plus-size clothing brand. The problem isn't being a fan of a star. It's that in Korea there's no diversity. They're all so tiny, 50 kilos at the very most. If we at least had stars with different body types, it would perhaps get rid of this cult of thinness. In the land of K-pop, one in six women in their 20s is underweight, and yet many continue to feel the pressure to be thin. That's it for this edition of Access Asia. From all of us on the team, thank you very much for watching.